Thank you, Dr. Postmus. So, I, good, good morning, colleagues. I will have a look at uh, the current status of our adjuvant therapy in early stage non small cell lung cancer with you today. So, I will look where we are, that's looking at the guidelines, and then look what we are doing to improve things. Uh, talking about the guidelines within Europe, so it's in general the ESMO guidelines, and the last one, it, the last edition came out in 2013. There was a consensus that complemented this in 2014, and the guidelines are going to be revised in the near future. Um, the, the, the predominant element in, in these guidelines are this, is the ALT study that for the first time showed that cisplatin-based chemotherapy improved things in resected non-small cell lung cancer. And this is 2004, so this is more than 10 years ago. And in general, with more modern chemotherapy, you can say that after anatom anatomical resection, you expect about 40% cure rate. With adjuvant chemo giving, given for 2 and 3A, you will expect around 50% overall um, cure rate in these uh, type of patients. And um, in 2006, after other studies came out, there was a, a meta-analysis that confirmed, the LACE meta-analysis confirmed that finding. But on the other side, you see why it's important to concentrate on stage two and stage three, because there, there, there is an increase in five-year survival rate, in cure rate, what we usually think, of 12.3% and 15%. And 15% in cure in, in improvement in cure rate is far from trivial in, in non-small cell lung cancer. And so, what do the ESMO guidelines say? This is the current status. You should offer it to patients with resected 2 and 3, and perhaps with 1B if the tumor is above um, 4 centimeter with a little lower grade of evidence. But, as you know from clinical practice, you need to take into account comorbidity and postoperative recovery. It's cisplatin. In randomized studies, you should aim for a dose of at least 300 milligrams per square meter, and the most frequently studied regimen is cisplatin vinorelbine. With the current knowledge, there is no place for molecular testing to guide your adjuvant therapy. With the current knowledge, there is no place for targeted agents in this setting. And taking into account the bulk of the evidence the adjuvant strategy is preferred over the neo-adjuvant one simply because there is more evidence. Perhaps the effect is not so different, but the level of evidence is different. And so it's anatomical resection and adjuvant chemo for 2 and 3A. And so how did we try to work on this? How, do we to, how did, did we try to improve? Earlier detection, you already heard about this today. We have a positive North American low-dose CT screening trial and we are eagerly waiting to see the results, obviously, of the Nelson trial, and they are expected quite soon now. We, want, we, we surely have improved local therapies, and that's what the debate of the next two speakers will be about, new surgical techniques, the role of stereotactic radiotherapy. But I will look at, did we extrapolate the major progress that we have clearly seen in stage four, to enhance the cure rates in stage one to three. Because the aim is different. In stage four, it's improving the length and quality of life. In stage one to three, the essential characteristics are improving cure rates. And so I will look at the three pillars of systemic therapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. Improving chemotherapy is, go, do we go beyond cisplatin vinerel being? do we use pharmacogenetic testing? And so in the ESMO guidelines, what we wrote exactly, and that was not a coincidence, is the most frequently studied regimen is cisplatin vinorelbine. That's just a fact. That's not necessarily an advice. We just listed the facts. Because in advanced non-small cell lung cancer, there are several studies that do somehow better than cisplatin vinorelbine. And what we noted is that in large cooperative group trials, several cisplatin-based regimens were allowed. And I come, that, come back to that a, a little bit later. So <clears throat> there was a phase two randomized trial looking at 
a more modern regimen, like cisplatin P metrixet in comparison with cisplatin Vinorel B. It's phase two randomized. You see the numbers around 130. So the aim is obviously not to prove anything on overall survival. But the primary endpoint was feasibility in terms of patient acceptance and possibility for dose delivery and so on. And what we noted is that if you compare with cisplatin pimetric set, there was higher feasibility, significantly different. There was far less hematological toxicity, significantly different. And dose delivery was clearly better than with cisplatin binaural bean. So if you think that dose delivery in the adjuvant setting is important, it means that some regimens may be better than others. And unfortunately, I think this phase two randomized trial with such a signal is usually what you want to go for a phase three trial. But in reality, I think it's very unlikely that we will ever see phase three trials again comparing cisplatin-based regimens in the adjuvant setting. So it means there is a duality. You can either be very hard evidence-based, and then cisplatin vinorel being, as we said, most studied, is the only regimen. But it means you will still use cisplatin vinorel being in 2025, probably. Or you can be more open, and say more recent regimens are better tolerated, you have better dose delivery, at least that has been shown in, in some studies, and they are superior in stage four. And it's an open question, and I leave it open. And then the pharmacogenetic tailoring of chemotherapy. There are several markers, and you see them on the left side of the slide, and ERCC1 is perhaps the most famous one, that have prognostic value in early stage uh, resected non-small cell lung cancer patients. And there are several others that have been studied as um, predictive markers, predictive for efficacy of adjuvant chemotherapy. And these are very interesting uh, results, but we have to be careful because none of them have actively, act, act, actually been prospectively phase three validated. And you perhaps remember the story about ERCC1 in the, in the LACE bioanalysis. What came out was finally not confirmed because there was a, a difficulty with the antibody to test for each ERCC1 expression. But nonetheless, um, I think these are very important trials. Um, looking to confirm this in a prospective way. Um, and there is uh, the Ithaca trial where we Probably you will have results soon. This is based on ERCC1 and TS. The French trial uh, based on ERCC1 and EGFR mutation uh, where we have results and it failed, for mainly for technical diagnostic reasons. The Spanish trial where we recently had results and in a North American trial where we will probably see somewhere the results in the coming years as well. So this is the Spanish trial as one example, because this, that, that one has the, the recent presentation at the ASCO of 2015 by Dr. Masuti. It's the standard uh, type of patients. They have early stage, completely resected. It's stage two and three here, and so they have lymph node disease. And they have either a standard approach that you see on the bottom, and note here, this is a this is a good cooperative group trial. It's cisplatin docetaxel. And then there is adjuvant chemotherapy tailored according to BRC1 levels in this, uh, in this uh, trial. And it's either cisplatin gemcitabine, cisplatin docetaxel, or it's docetaxel alone. Primary endpoint overall survival. And what Dr. Masuti reported was quite disappointing again. The overall survival was really similar between the group with the cisdocetaxel versus uh, tailored, chemo, tailored adjuvant chemotherapy, and also by BRC1 level, there were no real difference uh, according uh, to, to, to the different uh, treatment arms. So we are not there yet. <coughs> Looking at targeted agents now. So we started off TKIs, monoclonal antibody. The first one was gefitinib. In a resected population that was not really um, selected by some biomarker, it was surgery with or without adjuvant chemotherapy, followed by gefitinib or placebo. 
The trial was stopped prematurely because of futility, and when the full results came out and then were finally published, because you need some time in adjuvant studies, you see the overall survival was really superimposed. Actually, the gefitinib yellow line is a little bit below. And concentrating on the patients that did have a mutation, you see that the yellow line of gefitinib is again rather below than above the blue one. But these are a small number of patients. So, a larger study with erlotinib, the radiant study, it's uh, nearly 1,000 patients, did do some selection of patients. They took the patients with, which, have, which were EGFR positive based on immunohistochemistry and FISH, and they two to one randomized for erlotinib two years versus placebo two years. And again, the disease-free survival was the primary endpoint here. And you see there was no difference in the overall population. If you look at the patients with EGFR mutation, again, they are less frequent, obviously. There was a difference temporarily in, um, in disease-free survival. It's not perhaps fully mature, but at the present time, th there does not emerge a difference in overall survival, and certainly not in five, pr probably not in five-year survival either. So not really a change in cure rate. And for this, I want to show you just this. Um, this is very important work by the group of Dr. Carbone, and it's a slide I slightly adapted from him. What we try to do in adjuvant therapy is eliminate remaining cells after surgery, and we do this by targeting DNA by chemotherapy, and this is a cytotoxic effect. There is a concern because there is an equilibrium, at least this is the thinking, an equilibrium between oncogene driver pathways and stemness pathways, such as the notch pathways. And they keep one another in balance. So this may mean if you use TKIs in the adjuvant setting, you shut down the oncogenic pathway, which may be good, but you also shut down the inhibitory action of that pathway on the stem cell pathway. And so this is a cytostatic effect, and it needs to be seen if it's good. And this is not only theoretical in some um, uh, tumor cell experiments in, in his lab. They looked at um, EGFR blockade, and what happened if you, if you, you, if you do this with erlotinib, and what you see uh, on the table here is that um, the... Is this a pointer? Yes. That the total number of living cells, if you use, um, this, is, this is a control arm, if, if you give erlotinib three days, four days, five days in this, in this tumor cell model, you largely decrease the number of cells, but you don't increase very much the, uh, the stem cell type of cells. And so the fraction of stem cell uh, type of cells increases from 26 over 50 to 61 to 72. So that's a matter of concern, and they have also done clonogenic assays, and, and also with erlotinib, it was shown that test of clonogenic pot, uh, pot potential was enhanced if you give uh, erlotinib. So uh, we need to do the trials, and we hope that wisdom will perhaps come from the East. They have a lot more of these patients, and so several trials in Japan and China are, are looking at this. Some of them are already fully recruited and um, are now uh, maturing in terms of uh, survival follow-up. And then I want to mention Alchemist. Alchemist is a large North American platform in early stage non-small cell lung cancer, looking at these things uh, in resected specimens, and according to what is found in resected specimens, there are dedicated trials attached to it for EGFR mutation with erlotinib, for ALK with crizotinib, for patients without the driver, initially nothing, but this can be adapted, and in the meanwhile it has been adapted by an evolumab type of trial. And be careful if you see first results, because it takes a lot of patients and patients to study adjuvant. That's why over 10 years, what you can see as an effect is sometimes limited. And if you look at, tri I was surprised, and if you look at Alchemist on clinicaltrials.gov, 
You see, it takes a lot of patients. That's 8,000 patients mentioned here. And it takes a lot of other patients as well. And they say the, es the estimated primary completion date is January 2100. I don't know if that's an error or if it's reality, but I was really surprised by that. <laughs> we won't live through that, do we? <laughs> <laughs> and then monoclonal antibodies. Well, cetuximab is no longer there for non-small cell lung cancer. Nisitumumab is coming into the field, so maybe something will happen there in the adjuvant setting as well. But for antibodies, we have the ECOC trial with the, with the monoclonal bevacizumab and a very simple design again, a large trial, six, so almost 1,600 patients. Um, so after surgery, uh, typical, uh, the typical uh, cohort you want to study, they gave cisplatin-based chemotherapy with bevacizumab for one year or cisplatin-based chemotherapy alone. So there was no placebo control. It was an, an open randomization. Primary endpoint overall survival. And th this is what I just told you in the beginning. Look at what happened in this high-level cooperative group trial. If you look at the bottom, the chemotherapies administered, it's 25% cisplatin vinyl bean, 23% cisplatin docetaxel, 19% cisgemcitabine, and 33% for non-squamous histologies cisplatin B matrix set. So that's the open vision. Remember what I told you in the beginning. But unfortunately, it didn't work. You don't need statistics for this. The curse of overall survival and progression uh, disease-free survival were really superimposed. And then immunotherapy. Well, uh, immunotherapy is vaccination or checkpoint inhibition. And based on promising phase, three ran phase two randomized data and data and melanoma, MAGE A3 vaccination was seen as a possibility to improve the setting of adjuvant uh, therapy for non-small cell lung cancer. And based on these findings, I will not detail them totally, a very large phase three trial was launched. Two, more than 2,300 patients were randomly assigned. And they had the standard being surgery with or without adjuvant chemotherapy and then a two-to-one randomization between the vaccine and placebo. And what came out is first, as an oncology treatment, this is extremely well tolerated. This is more than 2,300 patients, and if you look at the column of the grade three toxicities, it's 37113. So, I mean, the, the major side effects are really nearly absent. But unfortunately, again, the curves were superimposed. The disease-free survival was 60.5 uh, versus 57.9 months, uh, and no significance at all. So what does this mean? It means that this is a very large trial in the appropriate setting. It didn't increase disease-free survival, and we really looked. It's a large trial for all kinds of different subset analysis, and we couldn't find the signal. It means that the promising strategy of uh, vaccination is formally tested here. And that therapeutic vaccination, at least with the current technology, does not work in lung cancer. And so where did we go wrong? Well, it's always easy to look back, of course. We looked at methodological differences between phase two randomized and three, there were none. Probably it's over-interpretation of initial preclinical and other uh, phase two randomized data. It's also raising the bar over time, and it's also the immunosuppressive environment of non-small cell lung cancer. Because what I did here is I made a cross comparison of the LACE meta-analysis, and it's the same scale of overall survival, and you see the difference, the overall survival in the LACE meta-analysis, which is mainly the 90s and the early 2000s. And now the modern, uh, really a prospective multi-center worldwide database, very well maintained. And you see that the overall survival at five years is around 60%, which means this is a kind of a benchmark for what we should do in early stage not small cell lung cancer, and which also means we clearly made a lot of progress, not because of the vaccination, but because of all other things, better staging, better surgery, better adjuvant chemotherapy delivery, whatever. But this is, in a way, good news for the patients. And then immunosuppression, well, if you look at the circle of immune response, 
you start here with tumor antigens and they go to a, a priming phase in the lymph nodes and then to an effector phase in the tumor. I showed this very briefly. But what we have, what we have taught for, for quite some time that if you foster this cycle, if you feed this cycle with well-defined antigens with good adjuvant principles, you will foster the entire cycle. It will turn a mu at much more, uh, ef more efficient level, and you have, an you have clinical effects in phase three trials. And this is not what happened. And that's why what we know nowadays is that the immune suppressive environment is important. We know how it works now. We even know how to interfere now in stage four, and it's a very relevant interference. But of course, this was not known 10 to 15 years ago when the effort started. And so this brings me to um, the next point. Immunotherapy, I don't have to tell you in stage four, we have a session on that, is, is a breakthrough, and everybody wants to be in the race with, with, with their antibody. And well, will immune checkpoint finally change the scene in a adjuvant setting? There are three large trials running, as far as I know. They have the same inclusion criteria on average. It's resected early stage, PS01 and adjuvant chemotherapy as indicated. So the first is the European one, PEARLS, which is an effort by ETOPRTC and an external sponsor. It's the largest one. It's almost 1,400 patients, and it's pembrolizumab every three weeks for a maximum of 18 doses. This is a year of treatment compared to placebo. The Canadian BR31 trial is doing the same with 1,100 patients with durvalumab every two weeks for a maximum of 12 months versus placebo. And this trial will enrich after 600 patients. They will only allow patients with pdl one positivity, which is not the case in the other trials. And finally, in the alchemist setting, there is ANVIL. Uh, that is a trial, a smaller trial, 600 patients, looking at nivolumab, 3 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks, again for a year, but there's no control arm there. It's observation. And so, of course, as I said, it takes time to have final conclusion on adjuvant trials, but this is predominantly what is ongoing now. So the standard is actually very simple. It's stage state 2, 3A, perhaps someone B um, with adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Unfortunately, the progress in stage four, which is important, very important, is not translated to the curative setting. And I showed you that for TKIs, perhaps we should be very careful on what we are doing. So I think the ESMO guidelines will not change. We will continue to say that you don't do molecular testing at the present time outside of a clinical trial, that you don't use these agents outside of a clinical trial, and we will probably say that vaccination is not, has not been proven to be a durable strategy. So what is the good news? The good news is that in a very large prospective worldwide trial, Contemporary multidisciplinary care in good centers leads to a five-year overall survival rate approaching 60%. The other things that we're looking forward to are immunotherapy, the screening results of the Nelson trial, and we should, of course, continue to work on smoking cessation. Thank you for your attention.